small versus large computer. Do I get a little micro computer? Do I get a fully fledged rack server for my home lab? It can be very, very confusing because there are so many options available to you. Where do you start? Now, having worked in technology for a very, very long time, I've seen computers of all shapes and sizes, servers of all shapes and sizes, servers that only cost a couple hundred bucks, servers that cost 10, 20, 30, $50,000. Yes, a server can cost that much. Pretty crazy, right? But then what is right for you? Now, before we do get into that, I need to tell you about this. Something that frustrates me so much is when you get a computer, a laptop, a desktop, and you don't have enough ports to run stuff into. You don't have enough ports to run a second screen, or you've run out of USB ports because they're all USB-C now. The best solution for you is to get yourself a dock. And this dock is amazing, has every port that you need. It is a mini supporter, got a number of USB 3s. You've got USB Cs, you've got three. Yes, you heard that right, three ports to run three displays. You've got an ethernet jack, a headphone jack, and what more do you actually want? I've got the link down below in the video description if you want to go check one of these out, but I'll tell you, I love this dock and you need to go try it out. We release videos every single week on all things tech and you're probably not subscribed, so why don't you smash that button? Well, don't, don't smash the button. Click on it with your mouse or with your finger, depending on what device you're on. Click on the bell so you don't miss out on anything as well. I've got small computers, like mini computers. I've got computers that are a little bit more like a desktop. I've then got massive, fully fledged rack servers. What should you get? Now, one thing that you need to have a think about before we even show you, before we even show you the computers themselves and start talking about the differences and the benefits and the pros and cons between each of them, what is this thing for? What is the purpose of this thing? You have to think about the plan. What are you going to be building on this computer? What software are you gonna be running? Is it gonna be running a website? Is it gonna be running a domain controller? Are you gonna be playing with Docker? What are you gonna be doing with this thing? How much money do you have to spend? I mean, do you have a computer that you can maybe just grab from your friends and your family? Maybe you have some old computers that you've got already here at home. If you need something more grunty and something that has a bit better specifications, well, how much money do I have set aside to be able to go and invest and buy that thing. A lot of these questions are going to then determine the hardware that you're gonna go and buy. Are you gonna be buying a small, medium or large? Well, a lot of this is irrelevant until you really understand what this thing is gonna be used for. Because if you're gonna be needing something that is pretty grunty, something that needs a bit of hard drive space, you wanna pump it with a lot of RAM, then sometimes a small little device may not be suitable. You may need to get something bigger. So this is where you've got to think about well, a small computer may not have a very big hard drive. A larger one may have a lot more. Your mini computers, these little things are super efficient. They're tiny, they're compact. Some of them do not even have a fan. You can start with a little Raspberry Pi. This thing is tiny. It has a micro SD port, and that's essentially where you have all of the data sitting. Now, do you wanna go and build a fully fledged Windows server on a Raspberry Pi? Probably not. You're probably gonna run a version of Linux that doesn't require a whole lot of grunt. I've got the Zimmer board, I've got some Intel NUX, I've even got a Mac Mini. All of these are great, and they are perfect if you just wanna run some basic things onto them. Now, most of these, yes, you can run Windows on some of them. You can run Linux. You can even run VMware's ESXi, or you can do Proxmox. You can do any of these virtualization technologies onto it and build lots of computers or virtual machines. Some of them pretty powerful, but they're not as powerful as getting something bigger. I mean, ultimately any computer can be deployed as a server as long as the right software is running onto it, okay? That's something you've got to think about. But of course, with something that is a little bit bigger, you can have much better resources inside of it. You can put a lot more RAM. You can put maybe one or two CPUs into that. There's a lot more grunt. There's a much bigger motherboard. You can stick a lot more hard drives directly inside one of the bigger computers. Then you move into significantly bigger pieces of tech. Now, these sorts of servers are really more high-end. They're a lot more high-powered. Commonly, you're gonna find these in an enterprise. In a business, they're gonna be running servers such as this. You could look at rack servers or blade servers. They sort of come in different configurations. You can get skinny ones. You can get ones that are slightly thicker and then even bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, some of these can get quite expensive, thousands of dollars tens of thousands of dollars. But the nice thing about something like this is when you open this thing up, 
there is a plethora of options available for you to pump this thing with a lot of RAM, dual CPUs, and you can just do a whole lot with it. You deploy them with certain RAID configurations, you have redundancy, you've got a lot more network points. You maybe even have options around fiber channel if you wanna run fiber channel connections. Now what about the space when it comes to the rack? It's a little bit hard to put a rack server just on the ground. I mean, yes, you could put it on a cupboard, you could put it on top of a table, but really these things are intended to go inside of a rack of some sort. But the other thing is that they are gonna be noisy, right? When they are turned on, they're not quiet, they're not silent, and it's gonna be running hotter. The last thing that you wanna do is put this sort of server inside of your garage. And then when it comes to summertime, you get like a stinking hot day, you're gonna have some trouble. This thing is gonna run very, very hot and could actually damage it. Now the nice thing of course about these little ones is that they're tiny, they're tiny. You don't have to worry so much about the space requirements. And you could potentially buy more than one of these for the cost of something like these bigger, gruntier servers. They're gonna be a lot more silent. However, they will nowhere near have the power as opposed to these bigger ones. But boy, can you build a whole bunch of stuff. You could potentially build a full virtual farm. They're incredible. Let's now talk a little bit about some server build ideas. Now, whether you're going for a small or a large server, you now know what sort of specs you need to be getting. But here are a few of my favorite types of servers that you could maybe be building yourself in your environment. What are we talking about when we're talking about virtualization? Well, you're grabbing a physical computer, a physical server, a physical piece of hardware, and then you're gonna be converting, essentially making that server into a virtualization server or a host. And then you can essentially install a whole bunch of VMs directly onto that host. And you can run multiple computers in virtual form on this one physical piece of hardware. But it can get very confusing around which platform is the best because there's so many out there. If you're trying this at home in your own home space, your own home lab, then you can try these generally all for free for a certain amount of time, some forever because some of them are open source, some of them are free with some of the limited functionality. Now before you set up your server or your computer with virtualization technology, but making sure that your CPU, whether that is an Intel or an AMD, does actually allow you to install virtualization hypervisors and get them up and running. Easiest thing to do is find out what CPU you've got and go and search online, whether if it's got the AMD or the VT for Intel. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to get any of these virtualization software operating systems running on that computer. Now, VMware is the leader. A lot of companies are using VMware and essentially you've got a number of different components components in VMware. You've got the hypervisor, which is ESXi. Essentially, it's an operating system that you install onto a computer, and then that will allow you to log in to that ESXi host, and then go and build and deploy your virtual machines, whatever flavor of operating system you want. To get ESXi host set up, you literally just go to the VMware website, you can download the ESXi ISO, you then put it onto a USB stick, and then you just boot from that USB stick on your computer, on your server, to get it all up and running. Your USB stick should boot automatically, and then your ESXi installation commences. And then just follow through with the prompts to get ESXi up and running. Once ESXi is done, all you need to do is need to go and open up a web browser from another computer on the same network, pointing it to the IP address that you would have set on the ESXi host. You've got Citrix, Citrix. You can go and install Citrix Zen server onto the actual computer. And that is now the operating system that then allows you to go and build a whole bunch of VMs or virtual machines within that operating system. Whether you're gonna go for Citrix or VMware, it's up to you. Of course, VMware is the bigger one. There's a much bigger community, much better support. Citrix, not as much, but Citrix is completely for free and you can get a lot more features out of it. So you go and try either of the two and see which one works best for you. There are other virtualization platforms out there, including Hyper-V, you've got Proxmox, and there are others. So the choice is yours up to which one you're gonna go. But then once that's all up and running, you can then start to build and deploy some virtual machines or some virtual servers. Where do you start? Well, here are some suggestions that I can maybe give you around what VMs you could start building. But really the choice is up to you. You go and plan for this yourself, have a think about the skills that you want to learn, and then build the VMs and the servers that are best for you. You've got TV shows, you've got maybe some movies. You go on a trip somewhere, a vacation, on a holiday, and you've recorded a whole bunch of videos on there. Well, you can centrally manage all of this 
on a media server, a dedicated machine for managing all of your content. And the great thing is there's applications such as Plex, which I absolutely love. You can set up Plex, you can scan all of your files and download all the cover art of your TV shows and things like that if you really want to. It's really, really cool. And then you can literally go and grab maybe an iPhone, an iPad, another sort of device, an Apple TV. It finds a Plex server out on the network it'll talk to it. So it's really, really cool media server. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually run your own website in your home lab, or at least learn about the technology. And yes, you can by building a web server. You can install WordPress completely for free. You'll install all the backend stuff like PHP, MySQL, like the database and all of that in the background. And because it is one of the largest web platforms out there, you having those skills will put you a little bit more in high demand. So go and play around with WordPress on a web server. Very similar to a media server is a file server, a spot to actually manage all of your files. And yeah, you may already have something like this. You've maybe already got a computer that has a whole bunch of files on there. If you're running Windows Server, for example, you can actually add some file service services, roles and services and features on that computer. You can take advantage of things such as SMB and KIF shares. You can take advantage of maybe NFS. You can set up security groups to actually allow only certain files to be shared with only certain types of people. You can sort of split this next one up into two different things, but we're here talking about a firewall and a proxy. A firewall, of course, well, you have a physical firewall potentially sometimes on a router. If you've got a home router, it's probably got some sort of a firewall built into it or a modem, but you can also get software-based firewalls. So you can build a server as a firewall. You could also build a proxy. Well, what's a proxy? So essentially a proxy server acts as a bridge between a host server and a client server. Essentially sends data from a website to your computer's IP address and it passes through this proxy server. So only specific access is allowed in or out. You could do authentication and things of that nature. One that I love is PFSense. Go and check it out, download it completely for free and you can set up a proxy and a firewall and you know what, this is something that is awesome. If, you, if you're wanting to know more about networking, if you want to know more about routes, you want to know about firewall rules, try PFSense, get it. So will you go small? Will you go large? Let us know down below in the comments. Let us know maybe what you're thinking about building. What is the sort of servers that you're wanting to build? We talk a lot about tech on this channel. We also release videos every single week and you're probably not subscribed, so you've got to smash that button. Smash that button, don't smash it. Just click on it with your mouse or with your finger if you're on a smartphone. Click on the notification bell so you don't miss out on anything and stay tuned for the next video as we continue talking about all things tech.